that's good. I turned to see if she was here because I was going to go pray for her. She, she's, uh, she feels our prayers, I can tell you. I felt somebody's prayers for me this morning, I, or maybe it was people, but I felt, the st- I can feel it. If somebody's praying for me, I'm talking about, you know, earnestly, I can feel it. And I know it. I said, wow, wow, I can sense that. I mean, the lightness, I feel light suddenly. No reason. It should be, there's nothing happened, changed in my paradigm. It's still the same, but I feel lighter. And somebody's helped me with that load, you know. Maybe it's the Messiah. I don't know. But I can sure feel a difference when there's an intercession going up for me. I'm starting. Praise the Lord. Mishpatim. Mishpatim. Exodus 21. And through 24.18. Mishpatim means judgment or judgments. And you know why, right? It's got this long list of judgments in this lesson or... principles and some positives, some negatives, some so it's judgment. So I, I equate this to as we did last week, we talked about it. This judgment is, is 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 just the nature of God's character of God described to his people. Uh, this is the way I am, this is the way I want you to be. And so we have this, I don't know, maybe 50, I think, somewhere around that Mishpatim in this lesson. I picked out one because it was just reading along and this one struck me. This one Mishpatim, this one judgment. Uh, and, and it struck me and I meditated on it and it just grew from there. I'm going to title this uh, Nakedness because I think that's a pretty good hook to get somebody to listen <laughs> To it, and maybe it'll come up on the computer if they type in nakedness, and then there it is. I'm gonna get this mishpatim here, this judgment. So I, well, I learned that from Debbie. She says you need to get some better. You know, it's hard for people to understand some of the Hebrew and the Hebraic lessons, the names, and they're like, "What? Who cares?" You know. So we're gonna talk about. We're going to talk about nakedness. And the, and the scripture reference is Exodus 20, 26, where it says, Neither shalt thou go up by the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. And I will just back that up. Where did this come from? What, what was this about? Uh, we, we can always go back to the garden. We can find, we can find the beginning there, can't we? In anything. The sin of the garden was accompanied by nakedness. Nakedness is attended by shame. In that they hid themselves and tried to cover themselves, and that was insufficient, wasn't it? It Those leaves. I remember in the hippie days, we tried to turn this dynamic over where there was no shame and nakedness. That, that's a part of that movement to the start begun in the 60s was ah, there's no shame and nakedness, you know, free love and free everything. So we tried to pervert the garden truth, and that is sin brings nakedness, brings shame. Shame is always attended, uh, especially as you get old and uglier. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I wasn't talking to anybody specifically. Don't <laughs> get all wound up. So we discover these these two first men and they and woman and she and him covered themselves with leaves and it was insufficient. So God slays animals and he covers their nakedness to a certain extent. He he covers their nakedness on an external sense. Uh, but he doesn't. It doesn't uh, uh, affect that internal battle that now is waging within human beings, and it's reflective of a death that was 
was brought into them. The sin brought death. And the death was a, an effect on spirit and soul and body. And when God redeemed them, or covered them, clothed them, he did it through the redemptive blood of those animals and restored them back on, in a certain way, in a, to a certain level. But it was, even though there was an internal work, <clears throat> it didn't have enough internal work to, to accomplish anything on the external. You couldn't see because they, anything because they were still naked. So now the death is resident in there. Nakedness is the death state that man stays, stands in before God now. All men, regenerated or not regenerated, stand in a state of death before God. There's only one man that stands without death, and he's in his very presence and sits at his right hand. Yeah, the son of God, the son of man. But every man at this point stands in a state of death before God. Nakedness is the death state that man stands in before God now since Adam's sin. Although regenerated, he is partially redeemed in that his spirit is made alive, yet he remains in a state of death and nakedness as it relates to his soul and body. So we know that in the essence of our being, even though our spirits are born again, we know in our souls we are corrupt and there is death. And then it carries from our soul into our body, doesn't it? I mean, our body is corrupt and dead, uh, has the sentence of death on it, which is the curse of death. So it, it, is, it has the fruits of death. Everything related to death is in me. God created man with a certain glory. And I'm, this is really what this lesson is about, is that we could see more clearly this glory that man was created in and is his destiny to be recreated in. It is about understanding that the essential part of man's salvation has to do with a reestablishing him in a clothing of glory. Uh, and, and you can talk about glory, and I, I've, I've read about glory often, and I've read many commentaries. I've read, you know, different translations, interpretations, and meanings. And, and I will talk about some of those things, but as it relates to this lesson, the biggest concern that I have or the biggest endeavor I have here is to get, convey the significance of the meaning of glory as it relates to us. Because you can say glory to somebody and they have either no idea what that is or very little idea, very vague. It's just all very nebulous and you say praise the Lord or glory to God or uh, we're going to enter into his glorious kingdom and or, uh, we're going to be filled with glory or uh, all those things we're kind of not really sure as to what that is. What's that relating to? So this lesson is about trying to bring more clarity into our understanding of glory and what was lost here in the garden. Uh, why, why when they sinned that this death set in that it causes this nakedness. And this scripture reference, neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon, is a reference to that death and that, and that sinfulness that God would not be able to be approached in. So, God created man with a certain glory and this glory meaning doxy, I think is a Greek word, but the glory meaning the honor resulting from a good opinion. We, we've talked about that before, where glory 
one definition of glory is an honor resulting from, not form, but resulting from a good opinion. Have you got any idea what that might mean? Of course, the good opinion would be with him where all glory rests. It can be extended by him who has glory, who is glorious. So whatever this is, it is his opinion that matters. And if one is to have glory in whatever form it is, it has to be of the good opinion of God, necessary, qualified for, uh, be a, a honor. He doesn't bestow glory on unhonorable things. So we should have in mind that all glory rests with God, whatever that is, and to share in it, it it's, it's by the opinion of God. And in recreation, or in creation of man, he said in Genesis chapter 3, 1, it was very good as it relates to the creation, or what I say is the recreation, right? When he made man and finished his six days of work, at the end of it, he declared, it is good. It is very good. So it w God had a good opinion of what he just created or recreated. So therefore, it was worthy of glory. Some, some form of glory, whatever that was. It speaks of being good. God have a good opinion of it. And since glory means that, uh, honor resulting from a good opinion by God, then it had its glory. Man had his glory. And Genesis 120 says, 127 says, God created man in his own image. Hebrews 2, 7 and 8 speaks to the creation of creation glory of man. And this is probably the most solid scripture that I have for coming forth with this lesson in, in man's glory, in that this is what it says in Hebrews as it relates to the creation of Adam. Thou madest him, God madest him, Adam, a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hand, Thou hast put in all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Well, there is a very solid description of what man was created for, and, and I've said it often that he's, he's created for dominion, he to take dominion and rule with God. And here in this scripture in Hebrews chapter 2, we have a clear definition that God created him in glory and honor. I know we have to look at this. If man was created in the image of God, as it says, and if God created him with glory and honor, then we would need to look to God's glory to find out what kind of image that he could have made man in. Image not meaning that it was an exact duplicate, although Christ as the God, man, son of man in Hebrews 1 says of him that he is the express image of the Father. But we are, we as man created, Adam, was as like unto the Lord. And we had the similarities of the Lord as opposed to the rest of his creation having less than the image of God. So the glory of the Father, God at all times, and then I speak in terms of a man, right? This is dust speaking. This is a, a small little brain speaking, and it doesn't even begin to ascend to, to, to the heights of what we should be able to comprehend or speak in, but it does what it does. And I just ask you to forgive me and the Lord forgive me for my kind of cavalier attitude here when I speak of things that are, are much more solemn and majestic than I give them credit, but it's a way of my 
conveying to you a thought, and it's the only one that I have, in that I say God at all times has moral and spiritual glory that we see not. Wherever he is, what, there in the third heaven, and in his throne room or throughout uh, his universe, wherever he is, he has a glory, a spiritual glory that we don't see. But what we speak of in this lesson is his manifestation to our sight. What he manifests himself as glorious to man's sight. That's what we're speaking about. Not in the fullness of God's glory can we speak. We have no clue. But we can speak to his glory as it relates to man and as it relates to him creating man in his image. Because he gives us some visual help to describe that. The first mention or view that we have of glory, glory of God, is here in Exodus. And the first time it is mentioned is in Exodus 16, 6 and 7, where it says, At even, at evening, you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt, and in the morning then you shall see the glory of the Lord. Hey, no one had yet since Adam had seen the glory of the Lord. <coughs> they were fixing to. They were fixing to. For that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. Now if I had heard that in the morning or in the eve, the Lord was going to show me his glory, and he's going to tell Moses that he's going to tell me, I'm going to show you my glory, and it was because of my murmurings, I would be a little bit on pins and needles. By the way, pins and needles is an idiom, isn't it? I don't really mean I would be literally on pins and needles. But I would be nervous. And here we have him going on to say, Moses, and Moses spake unto Aaron, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. It was covered by the cloud. But it, yet it shone through the cloud, right? I mean, it wasn't the full brilliance of this glory that he was manifesting himself in, for it was shadowed in a cloud. But it was something very unique and brilliant because there was no mistaking. That's the glory of the Lord. So we, that's the first mentioning that we have of this glory of the Lord as it relates to man, as not the fullness of the glory of the Lord. Do you understand? So what am I saying? I'm saying that the glory of the Lord shadowed in a cloud, yet had a brilliance that shined through it. So there's something that we can draw from that, that all definitions of the word glory draw from, in the A, B, C, D, E, or whatever, is that it's brilliant. It's light. It's splendorous. So here we have that manifestation. So this we know. God says, this is my glory. This is not me, per se, but this is my external attribute that you're now looking at. It's at least one of his external attributes. And that's why we can't approach him, is because he exists in this brilliance, this glory that goes beyond the shadowed brilliance in that cloud. So you're with me? What are we talking about here? We're talking about man's glory in the creation. I'm talking about how can we equate this nakedness? How are we going to equate this nakedness? What are we going to think about this shame and this nakedness that he now discovers himself in and he tries to cover himself with some leaves? And I have to go back if he's created in the image of God and God is glory and he manifests himself in glory, then now we can begin to get a picture of what type of external attribute that man who made in his image might have. And it's not a stretch in my mind. It's not a spin to try to accomplish a, some doctrine I don't even care about to begin with, that it is a light. It is a form of God's glory. Again, again, another scripture, and the cloud covered the mount and the glory of the Lord tabernacled upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it. 
covered what? The glory. Six days and the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Exodus 24, 15 and 16. Soon we see that God's glory was also a part of the Shekinah, which means presence, tabernacling with them in the Holy of Holies between the cherubim. And this is said to be some glory, this brilliant, uh, dynamic thing between those two cherubim. So here we, beginning here in Exodus, we begin to see what the glory of the Lord is. God is clothed in his own glory and majesty and could never be naked. God could never be naked. Man was naked. He was found to be naked, but God could never be naked because his etern internal, eternal uh, being and majesty and righteousness and holiness, all of that make up this that we view from an external standpoint that represents an eternal glory, brilliance. I like to think that he is eternally whole. He's whole. We say holiness, you, know, you can almost call that a synonym. I think that's correct, which is saying holy is the same as holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy and holy. So he is, because of his wholeness, he'll never be without his glory. And, and in the way that we understand the scriptures, man will become holy and therefore holy. In wholeness, fullness, completeness. In a form infallible, at least a, a portion of men will be. Those that are restored to this glory. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach, unto whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. So we'll, we'll finally see, according to Scripture, uh, that's all we have, we'll finally see him in the fullness of this glory, the full extent of this glory, in the city that had no need of the, of the sun. <laughs> Not any need of a suit. It didn't have any need of the suit or a sun. Neither of the moon to shine for it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the lamp thereof. So here we see the brilliance of the Father and the Son in the fullness at the end of the seven days, in the beginning of eternity, in the eighth day, we see a, a, a tabernacling with us that is, a, is over and above the light of all of those luminaries that are in the sky. For this city, even though the sun comes up, the sun goes down in the ages to come, Yet in this city, it is never dark. It's because the glory of the Lord lights, the glory of the Lord and the Lamb light the whole city. There's your glory. It's what he called it. <laughs> glory of God did lighten it. So just going through those few verses, and you can do your own, and I listed some more at the end of this lesson for your edification. Yeah, I'm not going to go into them, but you can read them. It's not hard to determine that making man in his image had to do with a, a clothing, a glory that was on him, on Adam. Adam was created naked, but not without covering. There's a difference. He had covering, but he, but he was naked. <laughs> he, he was naked under the covering. So the page, I shouldn't say that, should I? Scripture says that Adam had no physical clothing and knew not he was naked. But he knew not that he was naked because of some, he, it wasn't because of some naive innocence, but because being made in God's image, he was clothed in God's covering from the moment of his consciousness and didn't know nakedness. He didn't know nakedness. It, 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 was, a, it was foreign to him. 
It wasn't his condition. No, was there anybody else around that was naked? So, it, yeah, he didn't know he was naked because he had clothing. He had a glory. Being created in God's image, he had no covering of feathers. You know, we have, we have the birds, right? He had no hide or hair with him, nor scales, but had a brilliant covering of God's imparted glory. Do you see how this is tying back into that? Don't come up on my altar with nakedness. Let your nakedness be exposed. By the way, that's in the lesson. That's, that's why I pulled that verse. The angel's clothing or covering. I want to walk through this because the scripture gives us enough detail that you can get a really good picture of this. An evil angel. A, a Satan. It would be instructive to note that the word serpent in Genesis 3.1 is nakash. I don't know if that's the right way to pronounce it. but And it means a shining. We may have discussed this before, but not at length. You know what I'm, who I'm talking about here, right? The serpent in Genesis chapter 3.1. That serpent that came and tempted Eve, right? Well, Nakash means a shining. And Satan, the serpent, is known as appearing as an angel of light in the garden to tempt Eve. What? Let's look at that scripture. 2 Corinthians 11. If you're not familiar with it, let's just look at it so you can see where I'm going with that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, subtleness, or subtly, what, how do you say that? Subtly. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And then verse 14 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So we can see that the serpent... Uh, was more subtle than all the rest of the beasts of the field. In other words, it was, it was, it was above and beyond the abilities of all the other beasts of the field, whatever form the serpent was in before the fall. And here we have Satan appearing in conjunction with with the actual serpent. Some would argue that I, I really don't care one way or another, but I I'm going to take the Bible literally every time that it doesn't that it can be made sense of. And it can make, make sense to me because we have other scriptures in the word that talk about a mule talking. So, I mean, I, I believe that actually literally the serpent could converse. But what made it more credible to Eve and more credible for us to understand the scriptures there in 2 Corinthians and those in Genesis chapter 3 is the fact that when you unite this serpent, this beast, with which name means light, and it's more subtle or more intelligent than all the rest of the beasts of the field, you unite him with Satan. Satan and him converse together and then conspire together. So there's, there's this entity that now is more shining than any other earthly creature or beast of the field, and they're both appearing to Eve in cooperation and association and this further covering of light of Satan. It appears even as unto today that Satan can manifest himself as light, meaning he, he would have the appearance of an a, a unfallen angel to the untrained, undiscriminate eye. So here we have him in the condition that in the garden where he is, a covering of light, and this, and this together, these two together, the serpent, the, the physical animal, the serpent, and then the sa Satan, who is called the serpent throughout Scripture, they're adding this believability of Satan's ruse, since being in the brilliance of covering as herself, I'm suggesting to you that she was stood in a brilliance, a brilliance that was beyond any of the other beings on the face of the earth. She was made in the image of God. 
So she, it makes sense that she would converse with the, this serpent who is obviously a superior being and uh, superior, superior in the intellectual proudness and uh, could be one to be conversed with. The point being that adding to this, adding to the understanding that, that there was a glory or a light that was, was beyond the light, not, not transcendent, but also laid beside, there was other beings that, were, that had this some type of glory, a shining, this serpent uh, in the recreation. So, and to understand then that Satan, who is, he, he had a brilliance uh, of light, as is expressed by Paul in 2 Corinthians. So, moreover, in the description of Satan as the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28, we know that's double speak there, right? Uh, the Spirit of God speaks through the prophet to Tyre, the king of Tyre, but he's actually speaking to him and to Satan. And he says, it is distinctly implied that he was of supernatural order when he was called a cherub. We know that he was a cherub, the chosen cherub. Perfect in beauty, the scriptures say. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. And just as God condemned the physical snake, he likewise condemned Satan to the future, same future fate. I will cast thee to the ground. That's the word in Ezekiel 28 to Satan, to Lucifer, then Satan. And in the end, a self-consuming vaingloriousness. I like that word vaingloriousness because where there is this glory of the Lord that is of holiness, there is this vain gloriousness, gloriousness that, as I said, to the undiscerning eye would look and appear to being glorious as, as, as the holy glory. Are you with me? If you and I have never seen glory, if we saw Satan, we would think that was God. If he appeared in his brilliance, uh, we wouldn't know that, he, that that was uh, an evil resemblance of uh, uh, vain gloriousness. One, one created of his own self, vainglory, or if that was a true depiction of his internal virtue, we wouldn't, we, I wouldn't know. I'd, I'd be first asking, I'd be asking the questions, you know. Jesus died in the flesh, did he suffer, did he go to hell, did his blood pay for I would be asking him some questions. I would, I'd be making him own up. Yeah. So we have these on and on as you do your own sort through this and see if what I, I'm saying is scripturally sound. You're going to find many examples where the understanding develops of this light, of this glory that God has instilled in creation, in his hierarchy, not in his lower st state of being, creation, but in the hierarchy of human beings and spirits or angel angels, we have this, this common thread between us, spirits, man, of light and beauty and brightness that, that also obviously has this root back into the image of God. So yeah, we talked a little bit there about a fallen angel or an evil angel light, but then we have this good angel. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone. His appearance was as lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the watchers did quake and become as dead men. Matthew 28. Christ covering his glory. Now, without getting into all that, his fiery flames of ministers, etc., etc. There's lots of scriptures that, if you care to look, will bring you into an understanding of this brilliance that is associated with a good angel. Christ covering in glory. That doesn't mean that they have to manifest themselves in that brilliance. Because we know that the scriptures say that you don't know that you might unawares entertain an angel. So when we know of angels that have manifest, that were, did not manifest themselves in their brilliance, 
but took a covering or a cloak and were not brilliant. But if we saw them in their heavenly form, they would be brilliant. Even the stars are called the sons of God. They're angelic. They're, they're named because of the, the brilliance, the brilliance of them, each star. They're named after the sons of God. Christ covering in glory, okay? Quickly going there. The kingdom of glory has already been won by Jesus the Christ. Okay, that could have went right over your head, the kingdom of glory. I don't know, you know, I've heard that all my life, kingdom of glory. It was only the last few years that I really started dwelling on the meaning of glory and the kingdom of glory. What does that mean, the kingdom of glory? Is, is that something new or something different? Is that something that was and is, but I'm just not a part of? Or is it a new program here? Well, yes and yes. It's a new program that begins in the millennial period, the thousand-year rule and reign of Christ in glory, and it extends on beyond the seventh day into the eighth day into eternity into another or a form of, a greater form of that that started in the millennial reign, the glorious age of eternity. So we have the kingdom of glory has already, there, there was a battle as it relates to this kingdom of glory. There would have not been this kingdom of glory had there not been a Messiah. There would have been a kingdom of glory, but it would have been, it would, man would have been excluded from it. So it's already been won through Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one, Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah. He, for reasons we are going to dwell into in a moment, has won the right for the kingdom of glory. And we are called by the sanctification of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and belief in truth, the washing of the word, and the sanctifying of the spirit, to have a part in that glory. God calls us, seek after it, in patient continuance in well-doing. Romans 2, 7 through 10, 2 Timothy 2 through 10. Won't go in. If you can look up those scriptures, I won't read them. The Son of Man shall come in the glory of the Father with his angels, and then, shall be re then he shall reward each according to his work. That's, that's Matthew 16, 27. I'm going to read it again. The Son of Man, Son of God, shall come in the glory of the Father, in the brilliance of the Father. It's not going to be hard seeing him come. And he'll come with his angels, and then shall he reward each according to his work. There, there on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun. And his raiment was white, the word bright, as the light. There, that ought to give us our clue as to the, the fullness of the manifestation of the glory of the Lord in Jesus Christ's face. And you go to 2 Corinthians, or, yeah, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 10, and you can find this on both sides, it's 3, 10, 4, chapter 4, you can find this glory that is being referred to here, and this is this glory that's in the face of Christ. We see it in first read first chapter of Revelations, this glory is the brilliance in which he has won that he will appear, which will, he will establish the glorious kingdom, the glory-filled kingdom, the glory of God in Christ's face in the earth. And those that are with him are appointed with him are worthy are to be glorious as well.
the Father's voice out of the glory reveals him as his beloved son. In that glory, Jesus is coming to reign. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24, 31. Clothed in it, he shall judge the living nations. 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all the nations. It's just used over and over and over again. The word glory, glory filled, glorious. These are, this is a word that has tremendous meaning in the millennial kingdom and the return of Jesus Christ. I, I can't think that a man can can discern and understand the scriptures, New Covenant scriptures or Old Covenant in as much clarity with ignorance of this glory. This glory has to be, this understanding of glory has to be somehow established in us to, to be the correct anchor to discern these, these statements because they become as I said, you don't, they don't have any meaning if you don't have an understanding of what this glory is. This brilliant glory Jesus once had. He, he did have it once. And he says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So here we have been given the understanding along with Hebrews chapter 1, we have been given the clear truth as it relates to the existence of Jesus Christ as the Son before even the foundation of the world and that He was in a state of glory. Not just a state of glory, but a glory equal with God. Because Jesus having been equal with God, according to Philippians <laughs> chapter 2, you can read Philippians 2 if you don't recall what it says. He was then as God, outwardly clothed with glory. As God was clothed with glory, so Christ was clothed. I'm talking about externally now. What, it, 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 what you would expect to see is some manifestation of tremendous bright light as you would approach the presence of God wherever he might be. Although I don't know that there's any place that he's not, the word says that he is everywhere. But as you come closer and closer to his geographical location, wherever that might be, it, it is notable that his brilliance is shining out. And Christ is there now with him. Christ was with him, Jesus was with him, and Jesus is with him. And he was in that glory, and now he's back in that glory. This made himself of no reputation is the way that Philippians chapter 2 puts it. He made himself of no reputation. This equals emptying himself. Making of no reputation means that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found fashioned as a man. So he came through a woman, and was spun by the Spirit of God in her womb, and he took on the form of a man, which spiritually means he was naked. Spiritually, when he was born as a man, he was in the condition of a man in the sense of he had no glory. He had not this glory. He laid this glory down when he came down the steps of humiliation into the form of a man. So he took on this nakedness uh, that a man has. 
as he laid his glory aside, that is to say, the outward of seen attributes of deity, the outward sign of his deity, he, he laid it down. He, no, he did not carry it with him. He did not have it. These we see as the steps down into humiliation from his altar or throne, whereas verses 9 through 11, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, give his ascension or steps up to the altar. Now, that takes us back to the lesson, doesn't it? Wasn't the lesson as if you come build a mound and don't, you know, be careful not to display your nakedness as you come up the altar unto God? Well, this, these steps that Christ took down was, was as he was in glory to when he had no glory. These steps up were in that had to be in glory. For if they were not in glory, he could not approach again the throne and the altar of God. There's only one way he could approach, and that was not naked. He couldn't be naked. He had to be covered. He had to have glory. He had to be like God. He had to be in the image of God, if not the very essence of God. Because us as in the image have a way unto God in Christ's glory. But I'm suggesting to you that he could not have approached God unless he had regained through the humiliation, now his glorification. He could, if he had not re, re, regained that glorification, he would have not been able to approach God in that nakedness. Are you with me on that? Whereas ver those, that's verses 9 through 11, and it gives the ascension up those steps to the altar. And he was clothed in glorification. Wherefore God also, what does it say there? Wherefore. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The wherefore in that verse is saying, according to obedient works is the principle of resurrection reward that is applied to Jesus. What? I'm just saying that it was, it was the reward, glorification was a reward of his obedient works. Wow. Let that just soak in a second, Kathy, and then, and then you can comment on it. <laughs> oh, you're somewhere else. Well, I want, I want you to think in terms of the significance of that statement because what it does do, it defines for us the way up the steps if we are to be a part of his glorious kingdom. It defines for us. It is through obedient works that we can then be, expect to be glorified and join the Lord. If the Lord... If the principle of obedient works works to the glorification of Jesus, I'm suggesting to you that it's not a far stretch to think in terms of his overcoming principles as relating to those who, who follow in the same path of overcoming works. Kathy's first. She's behind you. I'm sorry. You didn't see her raise her hand. <laughs> The, the Lord of glory. The wisdom. Yeah. That's right. It, it is the path of that he took that we're talking about the fall of man. We're talking about the loss of glory. We're talking about the loss of covering of Adam and how now he can't. He can't come back into the presence of God because the garden, there's now this sword, this kept guy. He's been redeemed, but he hadn't been restored. And so it was only the propitiation and the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ that allowed us past the sword now. It is him having to come down in humiliation to offer himself up in obedient works unto the Father for the pave the way for us to come before, after him in the same kind of, of obedience so that we might be a part of his glorious kingdom. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, because what you see when you're born again, you have your spirit, you, you're regenerated, you have redemption, but 
Satan has blinded the church to the most important part, and that's to be glorified. That's right. Amen. Yeah. So it's more than just the, uh, you know, the uh, shedding of blood, you know, the redemption of man, because that's only the beginning. You're preaching my sermon now. So just hold, hold on. There. Yeah. So it's their righteous That's in here too. Oh. <laughs> Stealing my thunder. Whereas then, wherefore, I'm just bringing you back to that, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. I just want you to think in terms of that. Wherefore God. That's the reason God. That's the way why God exalted Christ was why. Because he was willing to be humiliated even unto death. The cross. And then it is that in that wherefore we're seeing according to obedient works is the principle of resurrection reward <laughs> and is applied to Jesus. And wherefore likewise is applied to overcomers. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. That's the lesson following here when we have the, the specifics that are given through Moses to Aaron and his sons as to the type of dress or covering they must have which is to approach God in his glory. This approach it has in view the clothing, the covering that we must have <coughs> before we can approach unto the Father as priests. Are you, are you with me? One's physical, one's spiritual. It is revealed in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, that Jesus Christ having been resurrected and now crowned, it describes him as who being the brightness of glory, of his glory, the brightness of glory, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And verse 4, it says, being made so much better than the angels. Verse 7 says, his ministers a flame of fire. So we have Christ resurrected in the brightness of his glory, sitting down at the right hand of the Father, and the angels being subject unto him, who was created a little lower than angels, is now in full authority in his glory, and now is administering uh, God's glory through the angels to man. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, 8, 9, which is just a continuation of what I'm saying, tells us of God's original intent with man to put all things in subjection under man's feet. And it is fulfilled in the Son of Man, Son of God. It would not have been fulfilled after the fall of Adam. It never would have been. A, we would have never been able to fulfill that word from God where he said to take dominion over all things. Behold, I give you authority over all things, take dominion over things, multiply. We wouldn't have been able to do it. So that Lord knew that. And in his view, future view, he had established this eternal plan through his son that he would become a man so that man might fulfill the word of God in Genesis chapter 1. Three. But now we see not yet all things put under him, verse 10, man, not all things put under man, verse 10, but we do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him to do that, bringing him <coughs> sons unto glory. It behooved God through Jesus Christ to bring all things under subjection by the Son of God, Son of Man. And not only that, 
But by his mercy and by his grace, he said, because of his merciful grace, he is able to bring many sons into glory. So it's not just Jesus Christ that he brought back into that relationship, but with Jesus Christ brought the potential for man to ascend again into a position that God created him in. A glory was his covering at creation. I'm confident that the, the, the word would bear up under that, that man was covered at creation with a glory, the loss of which was the sure outward sign of death in the inward spirit. In this day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. The reflection of that on the external was he lost his covering. He lost his glory. And the king... The kings of glory will be the outward sign and the king, king's glory will be the outward sign covering of man's nakedness. The king's glory, the Holy Spirit working in us, will establish the king's glory, Yeshua, in an outward sign covering of man's nakedness, not only redeemed but now restored, spirit, soul, and body, united in the fullness of the resurrection of life. That life, really, where it said that he came, that they might have life and life more abundantly, in view is this promise of reestablishing man in glory. That's the life more abundantly. Not living on the earth more abundantly. It's life. I came that you might have life and life more abundantly. That abundant life is this resurrected life the newness of life, Romans chapter 6, that establishes man again back in a like type kind of glory that he lost when he sinned in the garden. No man has been resurrected into his glory filled state except Christ Jesus. No man. The resurrection is yet in a future event. No man has stood before the judgment of the seat of Christ. For we are not yet in the age of judgment, but we're in the age of grace and mercy. It's coming to an end. Shortly, the age of grace and mercy will be over and we'll be standing before the judgment seat in the age of judgment. No man has yet been glorified. No man yet has been glorified. Glory filled. Every body, every human frame, every bone that's ever died is in the grave. Every one. Even the two men, the two prophets that never suffered death, their bones are still in the grave. They're not in a resurrected form. And if they are, that's fine. They still have a death to come. If they are the two prophets in Revelation chapter 20 or 18 or 13 or whatever it is, whatever, those two prophets die, then they'll suffer that death. But the point is, is that no man has stood before the judgment seat of Christ and has received the glorified resurrection body and is, and is ruling and reigning with Christ at the right hand of the Father. Because it's not at the right hand of the Father we will, he will rule and reign. It is above the earth where we will be caught up and he will come down and we will join with him. Not one Man has ever received his glorified body and went to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father with Jesus Christ. Not one. Every man that has died is still in the place of the dead. Hades. No body has come out of the tomb. Those that did have went back to the tomb. Those bodies that were resurrected, they come back. Lazarus was resurrected, but he died. There has not been a First resurrection, in that Paul clearly said that, don't worry about it, the resurrection has not happened, Thessalonians. The resurrection has not happened. And, and besides that, when it does happen, they're not going to precede you, because you'll both be caught up together. Those that are lay among the dead and those that are living will be caught up together in the, in the heaven above the earth where they will meet Christ and forevermore be. 
the last trump. That's not blown. There has not been the first resurrection. So where are these people? They're still, their souls are still in Hades. Not hell, but the place of the dead. Where Abraham is, Abraham's bosom. Paradise. So there, there they are. Their bodies are in their graves. They themselves, the essence of themselves, their soul, their living souls, they're in Hades, bodies on in the grave, and Christ is at the right hand of the Father. He has not come back. He's not come out from behind the veil. He has not been sent in the order of Melchizedek. He's not come in the king ministry yet. He still sets as high priest ever living to make intercession for us. And until he comes out and he comes down and we are brought up out of the grave from among the dead or off the face of the earth, we will not have had our resurrected bodies. It's only at the last trump when Christ comes back that he calls the dead up and the living off. And then we're together, united with him. Yes, Curtis? Just, that's, you guys know that stuff, but I just go on record because I'm talking about this glory that man is going to be reestablished in, and it, the question begs, when? Well, it's at the resurrection. Death does not some magically mystical way prepare you to go into the, uh, into the throne room of God. You're still naked. And most that say that you do die and go to heaven have not understood that how could it be that part of you is living in glorification and part of you is living in humiliation? For your body has not been resurrected. No one would argue that your body has not been resurrected. So you would be saying that, yeah, you die, you go to heaven, your body's in the grave, and go dig up. You go dig up all of our friends out here. You'll find their bones in the graves, by the way. They haven't been resurrected. And if they haven't been resurrected, their bodies are laying in humiliation. Would it be that God would raise them up? How could he glorify them, spirit, soul, and body, if the half of them or part of them, a part of one-third of their being, is still in the grave? Well, the fact is they don't. They aren't. They aren't in heaven. I was, I guess I would have liked to go on that. Can you explain to them? No. You can do it better than me. I have a friend at work, uh, you know, Wednesday that I go to, and uh, the term uh, to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord was brought up. So I made a comment, and uh, immediately I was. Like vultures, they did not want to hear what I had. They were not having it. Um, to the point where one guy I felt like he was mocking, mocking me in a sense, because I said that when we die, our, our places could it be that we go to the place of the dead, and that be paradise. And I brought this question out, and then another guy actually. Was, was like, yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because blah, blah, blah. But then the teacher, the one leading the Bible study, cut that off. He said that, you know, we, we are present. It's a domino that if that domino falls over, all of your religious ideas fall over with it. So you have pushback. And it's okay to have pushback, but go look. You know, don't be so afraid. I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't have have push back, and then I go check myself out, and then I find out that, oh, man, I've been wrong all these years. And, you know, that, that's the way you grow. But most Christendom doesn't want to face the truth if the truth's uncomfortable to their religious ideas. Yes? One, I like how you said God's omnipresent. So couldn't his presence be in paradise? You know, yeah, the absence of the bodies to be. I yeah. sent an email. But I like how you re are reminding me that he's omnipresent. So his presence is there in paradise. And even in greater presence. Yeah, even the Lord's yeah, presence. Because, because that, that has a greater presence of the Lord in paradise than we have on earth. There's no sin. There's no corruption. There's no, there's no devil. So you, you don't have the same dynamic in paradise as you have here. So to, be, to die is to be present with the Lord, is in a greater presence, but that doesn't mean that you're in the Holy of Holies with Jesus and the Father. You are in a greater presence, but, and greater to be dead. I promise you, if we had the assurance that we're going to paradise and we're in good standing with the Lord and we died outside of our sins and we're... We, 
it'd be a much better place to be right now than here. Yeah, I remember you saying that in another mm -hmm. lesson. You said just that. Yeah. Um, and then also when when Jesus was Mary, um, raising Lazarus, and uh, Mary was like upset that I mean Martha was, you know, um, he said to her, "Your brother will rise again." And Martha said to him, "I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day." He, I mean, he didn't correct her. She was right. Yeah. He'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day, yeah. the last trump. It wasn't yeah. just you die and you get right. No. Right. I mean, she, yeah, she, she, she was aware that, that there was a resurrection that hadn't happened, that was going to happen at the end, and, and, but he wasn't speaking in terms of that. He was speaking in terms of this temporary resurrection that he was about to perform for him. It was common knowledge. It was common knowledge till the third, the third century after Christ, all these things were common knowledge. Yeah. You, these, these things that I'm talking to you about are not things that I've come up with, they're things that, that our forefathers in the first three generations after, or four generations to five generations after Christ, that they believed. Go read them. Go read all of them. Go read any of them, forefathers. I, I'll, if you want, ask me and I'll send you a list. Because I have a list of all of the forefathers' teachings as it relates to resurrection, Hades, uh, what they taught. And, it, and it's what I'm teaching you. Okay. Yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a simple, it's a simple printout for me of maybe 30 or 40 of the most famous forefathers, all, that you've, all the names that you've heard, how they stand on what it is that I'm talking about. The first resurrection, the, uh, the place of the dead, where you go when you die. That was, that, those things were of the last few centuries that, that most of those ideas of the rapture has developed and so forth and so on. I think it's in Psalms, uh, King David said, uh, he can't hide from God. If he goes to hell, God is there. That's right. There, That's, God is there. That's, good. That's right. That's the reference that God is everywhere. We can't hide from him. Yeah. And, yeah. and when the Lord Jesus comes back, uh, People going to be seeking to hide from him, his presence, yeah. which would be so great. Uh, mm -hmm. No. Yeah. No, be like Adam. He was hiding himself. <laughs> David said, go and make my bed in hell. No, with yeah. Me. Yeah. Make my bed in Hades. Yeah. Hell being distinguished, right, from Hades? Hell being the lake of fire. Hades being the place of the dead, all in the center of the earth, all uh, certain compartment and geography, it's in the middle of the earth. So no man has been resurrected into his glory-filled state except Jesus Christ. No man has stood before the judgment seat of Christ, for we are not yet in the age of judgment, but in the age of grace and mercy. No man yet has been glorified or glory-filled with that covering, as it is not death that closes us, Close us. It's not death that closes us, but the resurrection, and therefore for him to ascend up into him, unto him at death would be to reveal his nakedness. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how it ties into the scripture? The reference there in Exodus. You couldn't go up in a form of nakedness up into the presence of God. You'd be exposing your nakedness. You are not clothed. You're not clothed because it's not death that prepares you or clothes you, but it's the resurrection that clothes you, restores you. Okay. 1 Corinthians 5 1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. We have something made by God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in the tabernacle do groan, in this tabernacle, in this earthly fleshly tabernacle, we groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us from the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of his spirit. That broken down is simply the same thing Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where 
He speaks in the resurrection from the dead, the glorifying of the body and the twinkling of an eye and each man in his order being changed into different forms of glory. That's all that he is repeating here in 1 Corinthians 5.1. He's just speaking in terms of, you know, this body, this form, this house that I'm in now is not the house that God has prepared for me. And he's given me the earnest or the down payment on, inside of me that promises of a greater house, one that's not made by hands of man, not that's formed through the union of man's, but is formed by the hands of God. The old covenant scripture we are pondering, neither shall thou go up the steps unto mine altar that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. And his sister uh, scripture, uh, which is in a few, verse, a few chapters later, it says, and for Aaron's sons, thou shalt make coats and thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother and his sons with him and shall anoint them and consecrate them and sanctify them that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Revelation 7, 14 and 15. I think we ought to read that. Revelation 7, 14 and 15. Is 2 Corinthians 5 1? The one that I referenced uh, is 1 Corinthians 5? Is 2 Corinthians 5 1? Oh, finally made a mistake. I knew I could. Yeah. When I'm typing, you know, there's all kinds of things can happen. Chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, 14 and 15 says. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said, These are they which come out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes, and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in the temple that he, has sit, that he sitteth on the throne, shall dwell among them. And thou shalt, back into the notes, and thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him that they bear not their iniquity and that they die. I hope that you can relate those scriptures to what it is that we've been talking about. And you can see that we in the, any death form without this resurrection glory filling, without the salvation of our souls, without that, we are not fit to go into the presence of the glory of God. We can't. Uh, we, 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 there is clear, it's clear that they, we would bear our own iniquity and we'd suffer death. Neither shalt thou, neither shalt thou is a reference to brideship, co-rulers with Yeshua, Jesus, Go up by steps is a reference to the first resurrection. Neither shall thou, that means us, brideship, co-rulers with Yeshua. Go up by steps is a reference to the first resurrection. Unto mine altar is a reference to his holy presence upon his throne. That thy nakedness be not discovered thereon is the vital discovery that without our essence being filled with the glories as a result of obtaining the fully Obtaining fully Christ's atonement at the first resurrection, our shameful nakedness would be exposed and thereby exclude us from going up. Yesterday I sent out, you know, on our men's Bible study email, I was, uh, you know, commenting on Romans chapter 10 and in Revelation, and I, for whatever reason, I was just the day before reading Revelation 16. Oh, because that's what we're studying at work. And in verse 15 of Revelation 16, he says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Well, you get in the picture. The picture is we have to be clothed that 
death doesn't clothe us. Clothe us. Matter of fact, death put us in the condition that we're in. Death has to be done away with before us, before, before we can be clothed. The two righteousnesses. I just say talk just a moment about the two righteousnesses. The putting on of the blood and the putting out of the leaven. Right? Is there two righteousnesses there? There's the putting on the blood, that's the redemptive, and then it's immediately after putting on the blood, the second righteousness has to do with the putting out of the leaven. So immediately following Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we can understand that there's these two righteousnesses that have, have to do, that have to have, we have to have in the end that are required to fully cover our nakedness. Adam had a redemptive blood covering that was equates to justification, but he did not have the unleavening that equates to sanctification, and therefore he was not reconciled back into the garden. Two coverings. Two coverings. Think about it. It requires two coverings. We have a robe of righteousness, but it also takes the breastplate of righteousness. Two coverings. To be first covered by God. To be first covered by God and yield to that covering of oneself as a result of that covering. First covering is by God. The second one is a yielding to that covering and having a covering of oneself as a result of that covering. An idiom that is an informal lingo. This is an idiom for a marriage covenant. It's the idiom for a marriage covenant. Ezekiel 16, 8, 9. Are you familiar with that? Ezekiel 16, 8, 9. Well, let's read it real quickly. Ezekiel 16, 8, 8, 9. It says this. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. You see justification there. You see covering? Then next, in verse 9, Then washed I thee with water. Yea, you see that? The water of the word, right? The water representative of the Holy Spirit. The water of the labor. The cleansing. The further cleansing after the altar of blood comes the labor. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. So this is, an, this is the marriage of Israel. This is the idiom I'm speaking of that I'm talking about two righteousnesses. And then thinking also in terms of Boaz. And if you remember Boaz, Ruth came and laid down and, and said, I'm your handmaid, right? And cast your skirt over me. You remember me teaching on that? Well, she said, spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. The first covering assures us from a certain complete nakedness as we enter into the afterlife. You see, when Boaz threw his skirt or his coat over her, that was a, a that was the betrothal, that was the, uh, what do you call it when you ask somebody to marry you? That was the proposal. It was the, I am going to take you as my wife. And consider yourself married. You know, this is this first righteousness that God is dealing with is when He throws His skirt over us. He throws His skirt over us, and that's the marriage proposal. And when we say, "All that you say, we will do, Lord," then then you have entered into that proposal covenant. Now you're not been consummated. You're not married, but. You, 
there is a righteousness there. There's a setting apart. There's a setting apart to be a set apart. And it's the, this idiom that we should be looking at when we're thinking of ter, two righteousnesses that relates to the first to the blood, the second to the out with the leaven. And the first covering relates to eternal life. The second covering relates to in, eternal inheritance. The eternal life is secured in the covering of God's skirt over you. But now there's a need to get rid of the leaven. Now we move from the Passover to leaven, the other righteousness. Christ's atonement has two parts to it. Two parts to it. Now the second covering is I counsel thee. Here's the Lord telling us what the second, second covering is. We have the first where he's cast his coat over us. The second is I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. All right, let's, let's look at that for a moment. I counsel you to, uh, to purchase from me, Jesus Christ, uh, what does he say? Uh, gold tried in the fire. Well, what is what is tried in the fire like gold? It's our faith. Our faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 says that, it, that our faith is tried and made refined like gold. So here it is. Christ says, purchase from me. I counsel you. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Faith. Tried faith. But purchase from me a greater faith. A living faith. A tried faith, a working faith, a living faith, that thou mayest be rich and white, and that word white is actually bright, and bright raiment, that thou mayest be further clothed, that thou mayest be clothed, ha clothed having been washed, they'd already had redemption, right? That blood's done its work, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. What? Is he speaking to disciples here? If, if you wonder where this is at, this is Revelation chapter 3, and it's dealing with the Laodosians. Church. These are redeemed people. These are blood-bought, born-again people. These are disciples. They're not necessarily disciplined ones, but they're called out ones. They have had the coat thrown over them. They've been entered into the betrothal process, but they have, not, they have need of a further clothing. And so he says... You're naked. You're naked, Laodosians. You're naked. You think you're not naked, but you are naked. You're naked, wretched, poor, blind, be pitied. Take from, take, come and take, purchase from me something. Something that will cover your nakedness. Then he said, lest you be shamed and your nakedness do appear. See, in the condition that they're in, they're naked, aren't they? Even though they're regenerated. So I'm just suggesting that if you are resting in your being born again as qualifying you for not being naked at the judgment seat, it doesn't work. This is a warning. This is an exhortation from Christ to the church. You think you're okay, but you're not. You're resting in the first marriage part of this covenant, but you're not. You need a further work. White or bright raiment here is the is the first place is in the first place spiritual as is as is the nakedness. Both are spiritual. Money can purchase physical raiment in abundance, and it's clothing is you know clothing in the physical body is a trivial matter. It's a trifle, isn't it? It's nothing. He uses as an example that they have a further need of a spiritual covering. Jesus is here graciously encouraging the regenerated. Just as it was that God said in the evening, or at the evening, I'm going to show you in my glory. Get everybody ready. And it was because of their murmurings that he revealed himself in that shadowed cloud of glory when you would thought that he would come in judgment and wipe them out because of the murmurings. He came in graciousness and revealed his glory to them and the, so that they might say, oh my God, 
Well, in the same way here, Christ is revealing to you, me, our nakedness, our murmurings, our hard hearts, our apathy, our presumptuousness. Our, he's revealing it to us by showing us our need for glory, a further work. And he's graciously encouraging, although it is, it has an implication. It has an implication. There's a calling down of a curse. If you don't listen to me and you don't do these things, then you're not going to proceed with me into my kingdom. That's the implication to all the churches. So I wrote, Jesus is here graciously encouraging the regenerated over whom he has spread his robe of righteousness to further clothe themselves. That's, a, <laughs> that's what we haven't heard from the church pulpit. Jesus has done it all. But Jesus has done it all as it relates to the first covering, to his robe of righteousness, but he's not done it all as it relates to your works. For it was by divine, obedient works that Christ that was elevated and exalted. It is no different with you. And he says, they need to further, we need to further clothe ourselves through a purchase or further exchange with him. We didn't, we, didn't, we didn't purchase the first, did we? Was it a gift? Wasn't the redemptive blood a gift? But now we have to purchase. He says, we have to buy something from him. And it's interesting, he says, you need to exchange, have do an exchange with me. And they're already clad with his righteousness, but another is needed for overcoming firstborn resurrection sons. If you're going to qualify to be a firstborn, resurrection son, glorified in his glory-filled kingdom, you're going to have to have a further covering than the gift of redemption, the blood. You're going to have to have something that he called refined in fire, a faith refined in fire. Purchase from me gold and raiment. These Christians are born again, but most are yet considered by Christ as shamefully naked. They're lukewarm, aren't they? Isn't that how he, he says they're lukewarm? He says, I'd rather have you cold. They're lukewarm. They're more distasteful to God than the unregenerate. They're branches without fruit, John 15, lest you abide in me. It's Jesus is the same word here. You need to exchange. You need to trade. You need to get in the vine. You need to be a part of me. You need to have some fluid activity. You need to get some fruit on your old vine before it dries up and dies if you're going to have a part with me. Otherwise, I'm going to have to, the Father's going to prune you off and cast you over there and burn you up. Hey, don't take away the, the scripture truth there. That's the, that's the truth. These Christians are born again, but they're they're lukewarm and they're branches without fruit. Why? Because of their faith lacking the refinement of love in him. Read John 15 and 16 and 17, and you're going to see that, that, that the, 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 the nouveau, the new covenant, uh, means unto the holiness of God comes by the faith that is energized by love. Galatians. Five, what, six? <coughs> what is understood is that they must be further clothed in their acts of loving faith if they are to join Christ in his throne in resurrected glory. What does that mean, really? I mean, I've been talking a lot, but it's pretty simply boiled down to, to our heart is, is, is divided. They need salve for their eyes, he went on to say. Purchase from me salve for your eyes. As they could not see beyond what? Beyond the cares, the lusts, and pleasures of this world. They, they, they were full. They were, they were full. They, had, they think they're rich. They have everything. They've got the pleasures of life going. Things are well. Things are good. And, and the Lord is saying to them, there's some obstacles here in your way in of obtaining, not unto the gift, but obtaining unto the prize, unto the glory 
filling of your soul. You're filling up, me filling you with my glory, this is required. You have to die, you have to unleaven, you have to yield, you have to take dominion, you have to do some works, you have to do something. And you have to do it in love. You can't just do it in works. Don't work. Won't work. He, he ascertains that and says, nah, that's dead works, that won't work, that's rote ritual, that won't work, kick it out, kick it out. Oh, that's loving. That's of my spirit. That's death. That's self-sacrifice. That equates. That works. Now you're going in the right direction. Now, you could, now you're getting some clothes. Now, now you're closing up. You're closing up now. Oh, that's good. You're in the store. You got some stuff laying out there on the counter. You're doing good. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, you know, faith without works is dead. Works without love. Yeah. That's the new charge, the new covenant is love, isn't it? Love fulfills all the law. This one commandment I leave you, love your brethren, the he that loveth the world, that love the Father is not in him. All the love, 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 love. Yeah. Yeah. The appeals. You know, there's this um, there's this confusion between love and love. We got the agape love, and then we got the philo love, and there's a lot of philo love going out there today. Maybe some agape too, but there's a lot of philo out there. And it's the agape love, the love like God asked Peter, do you love me, that that's, uh, that's manifests him. That is this exchange. Philo love is this exchange. Take from me. Purchase from me. He's, 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 he's exhorting them. You got, a, my coat is over you. I, I'm, 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 I propose to you. Now I'm asking you to, to fulfill the covenant on your part. Now I'm asking you to yield. Now I'm asking you to love. Now I'm asking you to fall in love with me. I'm, not, I'm doing it graciously because I don't want it to be a command. I don't want to order it. I don't want you robotic. I want you yielded, and I keep talking to you. Please, please, I'll show my glory to you. I will manifest myself to you in mercy, 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 grace, 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 until it just can't happen no more, until it's over with, until we die or he comes back. And it's whether or not we yield to this uh, merciful, gracious love when we deserve as murmurers or as apathetic, as presumptuous, whatever we might be, we deserve something harsher than what he's giving us. But what he is giving us, we're not even, a, we're not even acknowledging as of him anyway. Wherever he sows us into a corner and, and gets us uh, conditions that would, might bend us or break us or yield us, we fight tooth and nail. So all of these things of the world, cares, the lusts, and the pleasures of this world, they're all obstacles of the first resurrection. They're your enemies. If you intend, like Paul, that I want to be called out from among the dead, Philippians chapter 3, that's my whole life, that's everything that I want in life. There's nothing more that I want, and I only buffet my body daily lest I be found not to be worthy to be raised out from among the dead in the first resurrection, Revelations chapter 24, 5, 6. This is it. Trade this cares, the world, lust of other things, deceitfulness, riches, for what? For my, me, for more me. You lay down the cares for more me? Will you lay down the love of the world for me, for more me? Will you? That's, that's, the, that's just what he's exhorting these, the church in Revelations. So if we do, well, they're all obstacles of the first resurrection and successfully passing before the judgment seat of Christ. But in, then on the other hand, these things, lustful things, deceitfulness, riches, lust of the eye, pride of life, so forth, that which may be our, that may be our money. That's a funny economy of Christ, isn't it? That he would want our cares of this world, our lusts and our deceitfulness and our, all of that pride and all that, he'll take that in exchange for more, for more of his spirit. It's funny. Here's the cares, Lord. Here's my lusts. Take them. Oh, and then he imparts unto me uh, more of the Spirit of the Lord, uh, a more 
living, loving faith. That's a great exchange. It, but you know what? That's because it's of great value to him. Your, your dying to your flesh is a savor under his nostrils that he loves. That dead, rotting, burning flesh if you've sacrificed up on the altar is a sweet smell unto God. That's the true meaning of serve God in spirit and in truth. That's the true offering behind serving God in true spirit and truth is, is offering up your selfish, self-indulgence, carnal flesh. And you know what happens? There's this exchange. There's this infilling of the Spirit of God. There's this glory that you're imparted. And more glory and more glory and more glory until we come into the glorious image of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's Christ's money and his economy, and he will accept an exchange for purchasing further spiritual clothing that has the kingdom of Jesus in mind. That is enlightenment by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. This is what the scripture in Exodus 28 has in view, where it speaks of a making of clothing for glory and for beauty by Moses for the priests, and to put them on, put them on them to sanctify them that they might minister unto me in the priest's office. It is Jesus, the high priest of our confession, the mediator of our salvation. It is he that works a work within us that he might present, a, present us as worthy priests unto the Father. This speaks to the two-part power of the atonement work of Christ, of course, of putting on of his righteousness, but it also speaks to our putting on a righteousness through qualifying or living works. The word says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen. That fine linen is a, is a term for glory. Clean and white. It's actually pure and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of saints. He don't forget one of them. See, I told you we were getting there. Revelations 19, 8. The promise from the garden was this restoration of glory in resurrection. That's a promise from the garden. I, he, he, yeah, 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 yeah. He's bruised. He's bruised to heal, but uh, the Messiah's going to crush his head. He's going to take away his authority. You're gonna get, I'm going to give you back the glory. This is the, this is the promise from the garden about being clothed even in a greater glory. The snake or the serpent of the garden is still spewing poison and is about associating with like-minded Nekosh. You know that Satan roamed the garden looking for the one that would cooperate with him in the temptation of Eve to cause the fall of man? Well, he's still in the same program. He's still a serpent, he's still a snake, and he's looking for those like-minded shining ones with some sort of panache, some kind of dazzle some kind of glitter and gloss so so they look good they have the right kind of suits and clothes and their talk is they're 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 well exercised in the manipulations of men are you with me that's the that's the nakash looking for the nakash that's a serpent looking to align with a serpent and they're still today working and spewing out these are earthly creatures of men to represent the word with with him Represent the word with him. Satan looking for those that will represent God's word with him in that hath God really said? Hath God really said? That's the message today. Oh, yeah. I'm not, I'm not having much of that. I'm not having much of that when you die, you, you don't go to heaven. I'm not having much of that. That ain't right. That ain't true. That ain't so. It ain't what we've been taught. It is the word of God, and that's what the word teaches, but, you know, it's not church hasn't taught that. Understanding is revealed afresh in 2 Corinthians 11, 3b, 14, and 15, where it says, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel. See, they're transforming themselves. That's the serpent on the earth. That's Nakash. That's the earthly creature, Nakash. That's the beast of the field. That's us. 
transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Uh, I mean, that's a terrible indictment. And that is, the, that is the fear of standing for the judgment seat and finding out, didn't we do many works in our name? Blah, 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 blah. And rather than steal that garden glory of man as they did with Adam and Eve, they steal the greater promise of raiment, glory, in the resurrection. That's their, that's their program. And you might ask why. Well, it's the same program that he had in the garden is to steal the authority away from man that God intended. Today, it's to steal that joint authority with Jesus Christ, his cohort, as his co-rulers, as his bride, and rule and reign from that glorious place and that brilliance of glory and light that he had in the place where he's at. <laughs> yeah, he's got a lot of pushback. He's got a lot of incentive. More incentive than what we know. Our focus should not be on the news, internet, or TV as to recognize the activities of Satan upon the earth. I always hear, boy, look how bad the times are. Look at what's happening over there. Look, murders and this, that, that, that. Yeah, but we're not supposed to be looking there. We're, the Word says, but, but look at the pulpit. Look at the professor. That's where the, that's where the real subtleness of the Satan of the end time is. It's in the pulpit. And the reason it's in the, in the pulpit is where we have to look for him because it's easy to, to spot immorality, but it's hard to spot unbelief. See? And the perversion of unbelief is where it's, what spawns all of the immorality. But we're looking at that as the world and we as the church. But it's because there's no salt here that that's that way. For then when the light of Satan is taken for the glorious light of Christ's words, isn't that what they do? Isn't that what they're about? Representing themselves as Christ, they present themselves as having this relationship and this brilliant, glorious message that, that, that takes away self-suffering. It takes away uh, all of the death to self. It takes away the cross. It's already all paid for in Christ. There's no need for a further clothing now that he threw his coat over us. There's no need for me to be faithful. He threw his coat over me. I'm just going to go be immoral and unfaithful to him in all ways because he put his coat over me. I'm his. See? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole walk... <laughs> I couldn't help but think while I said that. Can you imagine? Oh, I'm sorry. Ask me afterwards. I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil... The, uh, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? What in the world? <laughs> well, let me just say, dar darkness can be light. That's really what is being said there. If you can't discern, you, you'll think darkness is light. And how great is your darkness if your darkness, you know, if, light, if your light is darkness? Well, you can't discern, you don't discern, and the way we don't discern is if we don't give up the obstacles. And what Christ said there in Matthew chapter 6 is, no man can serve two masters. He can't serve money and God. Either love the one and hate the other, right? So what he's suggesting to you that if your eye be single on him, there won't be the love of the world. But if there be love of the world, you can't love the world and love him too. So, but if you think that you can love the world and love him too, great is the darkness that's within you. That's the Laodicean type spirit. And what, what am I saying? I'm saying that that kind of thinking will exclude you from this glorious resurrection and the first resurrection that God intends 
Christ intends to bring us into. Not only to clothe us, but that we be clothed. Satan's object is to use men to teach error as it relates to God's word, thereby perpetuating the success of the snake and the apple. The hope of our calling is to have part in the kingdom and glory of Christ. That's what this message is about. It's the hope of our calling is to have part in the kingdom and glory of Christ. I'm telling you that shortly we are going to die or we're going to be caught up or we're going to be shaking in our boots. But I would suggest a very good chance that we'll all be dead. And we're going to be we're going to be faced with whatever it is that's on the other side there. It could be today, tomorrow, sometime, 20 years, 30 years, whatever. And we're going to be faced with, with the reality of all of these blah, 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 blahs. All this word. Did it, did it resonate? Did it work? Did it do anything? Did it cause anything? Is there a change in your scene? Is there a no more of awareness? Is there more consecration? Is there more determination? Is there anything working out of this today? Well, I pray there is, but if we continue to ignore the call that God has given us, at some point we will find ourselves dead, and it will be too late, and we will look upon ourselves as having, like Solomon, why was I so stiff-minded, hard hard-hearted. Why wouldn't I listen to discipline? Why didn't I? Why didn't I? Because the object of men is to teach the error of God's word and it's perpetuating this, this darkness within us. And, but the hope of our calling is to have part in the kingdom and glory of Christ. While we're alive, that if we'll hear this message and we'll apply these things to our hearts, we'll, if we will be exhorted and we will be comforted and charged every one of us as a father does his children, that we should walk worthy of God who is inviting us to his own kingdom and glory. That, that's what we don't want to regret when we find ourselves on the other side. We don't want to regret that we didn't uh, uh, attend to these, these meaningful uh, words that encourage us and exhort us to die to our selfish, carnal souls and love Christ with our hearts and learn to love Him, grow in love, grow in faith, um, take dominion over the flesh and see Him grow in us more likeness of Christ. That's the calling. What we have in view is to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13-14 The Lord grant us to aim at this if by any means we may attain to the resurrection of the righteousness from among the dead and to having a part in the millennial kingdom of glory. Amen? Ha ha. I'm done. That is... Okay, you said to ask you what you meant. I was about oh. to say the same thing. The light of the body is the eye, and you said, can you imagine... No, I, I was, I was, my brain went off and it was just terrible. And I was just so embarrassed. It was such a solemn moment there. And I went to, you know, where that movie, uh, you know what I'm trying to remember? Yeah. I went to the movie of, of the Pat, One My Patch Sheriff uh, movie, the Western. And, and, and that Damon, what's his name, Damon? It was Damon. Matt Damon was playing... True grit. And Matt Damon said, and he said that, or should I say I? You know? <laughs> I know. It's terrible. That's where my mind, my brain went when I read that. <laughs> yeah, if you don't have you ever seen the movie, you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I thought that one line was kind of funny. Because he was trying to shoot those those biscuits and he was drunk and he had his pistol and he was missing. He said, uh, he said something. Out. Blah, blah. That's what I was talking about. Sorry. Just, just an old carnal flesh going there. Yeah. No. I'm owning up. It was just plain stupidity. Because the way I said it, I said, I. Instead of I. I don't know. I said, I. And my brain went there automatically. Where'd you get that? I got that from that movie. I. <laughs> yeah, I know. I said, I thought, well, it's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? 
Well, I'm so grateful to the Father for y'all. I really am. I'm so grateful that you come. I'm so grateful that you sit here and you endure. And I, I hope your body, uh, I hope you have a special grace that your body can be renewed and that, that your mind and your spirit would be, be uh, fed. Be fed and that you have that you have something that's created in you today, something that's working in you, something that we can take away from here. This is the climax of everything that you've been teaching for the last two years. As Jerry and I went back and listened to uh, teaching from April of 2013, and it's like this is where God was trying to get us to. April 13th? It was right before Passover. When we first start teaching about where the body goes after death, the soul and all that. And to me this is where you where you've been trying to get to this whole time. Hallelujah. Had you laid this out then it wouldn't have had really any as much significance as it does now. As you just, you know, blah blah it two years ago. But everything that we've learned up to this point makes this to yeah. me one of those important lessons. Yeah, if you, if you could go back near twenty years and see see how I approach this same lesson, you know. It's a you know because I got tapes, you know, di uh, what audio tapes back then. But if you went back there, you, you know, you could see it's just a building. It's just a building all the way through for all these years. It's just building and building and building and and I think it's what it's saying is is this, this there's this progression and I don't know you know I think it's kind of a worldwide progression. I don't think it's something unique to this room, but it's a progression of the Spirit of God bringing people into an understanding through the Torah, through, through, through the Old Covenant, and, and bringing, that, bringing out these truths that, that God is establishing in the New Covenant to, in their true full meaning so, because of the significance of the time we live in. This is closer than that day, 20 years ago. Ten years ago, five years ago, and as the time is growing close to to these end time things, there's more and more light to shed on the purposes uh, for which we are here, and and He's revealing those things that have to do with the last days because it is the last days. We don't need to talk about some of those things we talked about 20 years ago that were all historically good and true, but they weren't, they weren't what we needed for the moment today. They're not what we need today. We don't need to go back there and rehash, revisit those things. We need to keep moving with the Lord. And if this was a period on it after two years of talking about where you go after death, great, let's move on to the next thing. Let's see what God's got in store for us because that's, it's glory filling as it's, it's we yield ourselves to the Lord and we continue and, and press forward that, that I hope to see the results of faithfulness and fruitfulness. Amen. Jerry Singh, there's no use me getting done early. In